This episode of Lifehacker is brought to you by Busted Tees. So let's get started. Good? Okay. Hi, welcome to Lifehacker. This week we are gonna go behind the scenes and take a look at how you can make your own video podcast. So, let's get started. So before you get to shooting and editing your project, you're actually going to need to figure out what you want to do and plan it all out. That's going to involve some collaboration possibly and figuring out what you're going to need to accomplish it. First, I'd recommend jumping into something like Google Docs, especially if you're working with other people. You guys can work with the same content, uh, make sure you've got the same ideas, you can work on shot lists and get everything sort of planned out ahead of time. Google Docs is a great place to do that because you've got one bucket, it's always up to date, everyone's always working with the same stuff. So like I said, during your planning, you're also gonna wanna set up your shot list. As you know, you watch a movie and it goes from start to finish, but that's not normally the way that movies are actually shot. Uh, you're at one location at a certain time, the sky, the weather, it's a certain way, you're at another at another time, and you can shoot your whole thing a lot more efficiently if you plan it so that you shoot all of the different things at the same locations at the same time, regardless of when it happens in the chronology of your actual finished product. When it comes to gear, the one thing that you're really going to want to have is a video camera because you can't really record video without one. And it doesn't really matter what you've got as long as you're shooting something interesting. A cell phone, for example, can be sufficient, so can a little handy cam. And if you really want to step things up, then you can just go ahead and grab a DSLR with video capabilities. Those are pretty great. The other thing you want to concentrate on is sound. The Zoom H1 is a really cheap portable audio recorder and can make the sound on your cell phone or handy cam or DSLR sound really good anyway, but if you want to get its bigger brother, the H4n, that will really make a big difference in your portable audio recording. Lastly, the most important thing that you can get in any video situation is good lighting. Now, if you can't afford any lights, then using the sun is your best bet. If you just shoot in the direction of the sun, so it's facing your subject and the camera is in front of it, then you'll get a pretty decent amount of lighting. Alternatively, if you can afford lights, just a few soft boxes can be great. You don't need anything really dramatic. We're just talking about a video podcast here. You can save that dramatic film noir lighting for the movies. Hey guys, I'm Jordan Dertinger. I shoot and edit The Life Actor Show. When the time comes to film your project, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. The first step to a successful shoot is adequate preparation, as both Adams had mentioned. Always come to your shoot with a clear idea of what you're going to film and how you're planning on doing it. Without a plan and a shot list, your shoot will become exponentially more stressful and you won't be able to concentrate on things like directing your talent. No matter what equipment you're shooting on, you're going to need some kind of camera support, like a tripod. Some handheld shoots can be useful depending on the context, but keeping the camera steady throughout your project will go a long way in maintaining a clear, consistent visual style. Avoid handheld shooting altogether if your camera or lens don't support some kind of optical stabilization. The settings and details of your shoot will always depend on the camera used and the setup, but there are some techniques you'll want to keep in mind. Always make sure your subject has good lighting. Even if they look good to the human eye, most cameras require a lot more light to look decent. Also, different types of light yield different color temperatures. Most cameras have a setting called white balance that allows you to adjust the camera's color temperature to match the scene. You also want to make sure that you shoot to edit. At the most basic level, this means you'll want to shoot your project knowing what type of editing is going to be done. It's always good to shoot a couple angles of the same scene and piece it together in post, so you don't have to nail it all down in one take. This is barely scratching the surface of everything involved in the shooting process. There's a ton more to read online, so do some research if you're interested. Just remember, if your scene is well lit, you shoot on auto, and a camera is well stabilized, you'll most likely be okay. Once you're done shooting, it's time to edit your video. This can seem pretty daunting, but once you learn a few basics, you can edit your video down in no time. Here's some things you want to keep in mind. While the fundamentals are constant, the details of editing can change depending on what program you're using. Check out our night school to see a step-by-step -step intro on how to use some of the most popular programs on the market. One of the most important things to keep in mind when you're editing your video is to keep it interesting. You're not only trying to hold your viewer's attention with the information, but with also the visuals, which means it's always better to show than tell. If you're just showing me talking for a long time, or showing a stagnant shot, you're going to lose interest. That means cutting it down to just the essentials. If you have a shot in there that you don't need to tell the story, don't use it. One of the advantages editing gives you is if you can't make it through an entire segment in one take, you can easily pick it up from another camera angle and it won't look that awkward to your viewer. In the end, remember, your visuals can not only keep it interesting, but they can do a pretty good job of telling the story. 
even sticking three completely unrelated clips together in a sequence can tell something to your viewers. It's starting to get colder outside, and this week on Lifehacker, we tackled the tough problem of tearing yourself away from your pleasant slumber to start the day. We've gone over some tricks to force yourself up, like setting up multiple alarm clocks or putting them in different rooms even, but it's hard to wake up when punishment is your main motivator. Milani ran down some good solutions to make the process more comfortable, including starting in an automatic coffee maker so you're beckoned out of bed by a pleasant smell that's associated with starting the day. Alternatively, you could just set water to boil or make oatmeal in a slow cooker overnight. If the sun wakes you up, think about creating a DIY sunrise simulator with a halogen lamp or just use an awesome upbeat song. A couple weeks ago, we showed you how to fix Gmail's latest annoyances with some scripting and user styles, but this week we're diving in how to master the new Gmail. Whitson's compiled a comprehensive list of tips and shortcuts from how to tweak the layout to learning keyboard and mouse shortcuts to figuring out which extensions and labs you should use, as well as how to get Gmail offline on your desktop. Gmail is our favorite email client, so if you use it as much as we do, you're guaranteed to find something new and useful. Finally, the holidays are upon us, and that means the tech savvy among us are tasked with dishing out some tech support to family members less skilled. Teaching your family about technology can be a trying experience, but there are some ways to make it better. Instead of just solving the problem for them, for example, teach them how to do it, so you don't have to deal with it next time. Screencasting and VNC software can also help you visually demonstrate how things work from afar. You can also show them Lifehacker's emailable tech support, which has a ton of great beginner how-tos. If you're really patient, just sit with them and have them practice the basics. Or if you're not feeling up to it, you could always ignore them. That'll probably come back to bite you, though. Oh, hello there. I'm Hannah Hart, host of My Drunk Kitchen and Inadvertent Web Celebrity. I'm here to give you a couple helpful tips about building your online community. One piece of advice is while 9 times out of 10 comments on YouTube will tell you you look like a gerbil and they want to take a shit on your neck, other times they'll actually offer some pretty helpful tips. Via my YouTube comments I learned that people now wanted a My Drunk Kitchen Facebook fan page. Uh, after reading about that I built it, set it up, and suddenly I had a pretty substantial fan page. Uh, after that, I usually use my Twitter as my number one go-to method for interacting with my fans. But for stuff off-topic with My Drunk Kitchen or anything like that, I just ask them questions, I just do straw polls, I do music. I use my Twitter in a very personal way, which is great because it allows my fans to know that I want to engage in the community as much as they are. I don't want to just be like the omnipotent YouTube video-making figure that watches them while they sleep. I mean, I I do that for fun, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, in terms of time commitment, since I'm not the most regular YouTube content producer, I make sure that I spend a couple hours every day touching base with my community, letting them know that I'm thinking about them or that I'm working on other projects, or even just asking what they're up to in their lives. Uh, I think one of the most true statements that people often ignore is the internet is made up of people, you know? And so you need to reach out and touch base with them, lest they forget you exist completely. Uh, so, you know, if you are endeavoring to build your own internet sensation, best of luck. And uh, you can follow me at Harto, uh, that's on Twitter, or find the My Drunk Kitchen fan page at facebook.com slash my.drunk.kitchen. Uh, enjoy and don't give up. Hey guys, I'm Zach Miner, the producer of The Life Hacker Show. Now, once your project is all cut and ready to go, you need to distribute it. You need to put it online so that other people can see it. This may seem like a pretty obvious step, but there's actually a lot of things that you can do in this process to make your video more likely to attract viewers. Now, when you're choosing where to upload your video, there's a few options online, but the best one is probably YouTube. That's just where most people are watching videos online right now. So that's where you want to put your video. Now, it's tempting to think that the bulk of the work happens in the planning and shooting and editing phases and that uploading is relatively simple. Well, there's actually a lot of work you can do after your video is uploaded to make it more likely to attract viewers. Here's a few of them. A really important part of optimizing your video is titling it properly. It may seem obvious, but you want to put your most SEO-friendly keywords at the front of your title and the less important stuff at the end. 
So for instance, if you're starting a web series, it might seem tempting to say like, put the name of the web series at the front, like Life Hacker Show. But we don't do that because we want to put what the episodes are about at the front. People aren't necessarily going to search for your series, especially when you're just starting, but they're going to search for the stuff that you talk about. So put that first. Now Hannah talked about all the ways that you can engage your viewers off YouTube using Twitter and Facebook, and these are really great resources. But there's actually a lot of engagement and optimization that can happen on YouTube as well. For instance, you want to be aware of your commenters and you know, if they're asking questions, you can respond to those comments. You also want to ask questions of your viewers so that it's not just a one-way you know, consumption street. You know, put calls to actions, put questions in your videos, and then pay attention to what your viewers respond. You also want to do stuff like um, put videos in a playlist. You know, if you are making a video on a specific topic, find other videos that talk about that and put them in a playlist so that people can you know, watch that. Um, you can also experiment with using your video as a video response on YouTube so that it appears below a relevant video, one that maybe has more views. You also want to create big, bright thumbnails that attract people. This is just scratching the surface of all the optimization that can happen on YouTube. If you're interested in reading more, a great resource is the YouTube Playbook, which is available at youtube.com slash playbook. Playbook is a 100-page document that was created for YouTube creators that covers everything from what to do in the first 15 seconds of your video, to how to optimize it on YouTube, how to add metadata, how to create thumbnails, everything that you could possibly want to know is in there. So if you're really serious about creating video online, you need to go read that. Go check it out. Hungry? Thirsty? The refreshment stand is open. Let's take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, Busted Keys. Whether you're into movies, video games, science fiction, or just wrapping your torso with something weird, Busted Tees has you literally covered. You've probably seen a Busted Tee or two pop up in a movie or TV show, and now you can own one for yourself. Just head on over to BustedTees.com to find the shirt of your dreams. Your bizarre, hilarious, frightening dreams. And be sure to enter the coupon code LIFEHACKER at checkout, because you'll get 10% off your order, and you'll be supporting our show. So win-win. And now, it's showtime. Whitson, did you get that thing that... So, that is it for this week. We'll see you next time.